to this session where we're going to be talking about how we're actually going to make the Sustainable Development Goals work for girls and women. And we're going to look at it from a regional perspective. We all know that creating the SDGs was a Herculean task and took many, many years. Um, and the outcome is quite impressive, but I think the task ahead of us is even bigger. How are we actually going to implement them? Now, we have a tremendous panel composed of people from many of the countries where this really needs to happen, um, who are going to discuss this with us. And let me introduce them, but at the far end, we have Tawakol Karman from Yemen, our Nobel Prize winner, who basically doesn't need an introduction because I suspect that all of you saw her shine <laughs> on the opening panel on the first day. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I would, however, like to point out that she was actually on the commission that helped to draft the SDG document, so thank you for that. And next to her is Lina Abu, ha Abu Habib from Lebanon. She is the co-executive director of the Women Learning Partnership and will be telling us, obviously, a lot about what's happening in the Middle East. Then we have Deborah Dinitz from Brazil. She's the co-founder of an organization called ANIS, which is the Institute of Bioethics, Human Rights and Gender. And I would highly recommend, if you haven't already done so, that you try to see her documentary about Zika which she will be talking about a little bit, what's in the documentary, uh, the Zika virus later. But it's a very moving documentary. Next to her, Hina Jilani, an amazing human rights activist, lawyer, working with the uh, Constitutional, uh, the Supreme Court in Pakistan, and also a member of the Elders, a group of wise men and women that's very dear to my heart. Next to her, we have Siva Tan, I'm sorry, Tanen Tirian from Malaysia, who is the executive director from Aero. Then we have Mona Mehta from India. She's the gender equity manager at Oxfam for, for Oxfam for Asia. And then our star man on the panel, Jotam <laughs> Musinguzi from Uganda. He is the director general of the National Population Council in Uganda. Now, I guess you're all going to be very happy to hear that each of these amazing panelists have promised me that they're going to be brief and brilliant in everything that we discuss, and that I actually, if they go on too long, I have permission to cut them off. So we're going to see how we get covered as much as possible in, in uh, this hour and a half that we can spend together. And before diving into the meat of the SDGs, I actually would like to hear from each of them if you could describe the moment in your life that made you determined, committed, to stand up for equality for girls and women. Tabako, I was wondering if we can start with you. It's a lot of moments from uh, my childhood when I was seeing my country suffered from many crises. It's insecurity, economic, uh, politically. I decided uh, to carry the initiative to help my country. I decided to be the woman who led my country to its freedom and dignity and democracy. So it's a lot of things around me. I can't say one new point because I grew up with a destroyed country that is ruled by the tyranny and corruption. Yeah, thank you. Lina. Yeah, I think it comes from schooling or a reaction to schooling. I've done all of my schooling in a girls' school, in a Catholic school. And because there was war in Lebanon at some point when we became pre-teenagers, uh, it became a co-ed school. And I realized how much the nuns were treating us differently. They were raising us to be desperate housewives. And they had all the respects possible and all the opportunities possible for the new guys who came to the school. And I thought there was something wrong with that. I'm sure there is something else for us in life. And I'm sure that this difference in treatment is definitely not fair. So it goes back a long, long time ago. Thank you. Deborah. Yeah, it is really a personal story. I was in the end of my 20s as a young scholar at the university. And doing research on public health and in Latin America, you have to talk about abortion. And I was professor at a Catholic university, and I was fired, dismissed, I lost Just my job. Show me that thing they so said since that long. day, can I decided to be fully about? committed of demonstrating how abortion has to be a human right. 
Thank you, Deborah, for sharing that. Um, Hina. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Mabel, like everybody else, I don't think it was one moment, but an accumulation of experiences and observations as a girl, as a woman, as a human rights defender, and as a lawyer, that one realized how unjust things were. Um, but I think the moment that I can relate to is the early 80s, when there was actually legislation in my country which reinforced social attitudes that one was wanting to eliminate, um, that it became, uh, you know, an urgent business to, to re relieve and, uh, and eliminate practices as well as policies that were affecting women's lives. Thank you, Siva. Well, um, I must say that um, I agree with Hina that it's not just you know one more one point a moment in time, but I remember that uh, the earliest memory that I have um, of being unfairly treated is when I was five years old. So I come from a society which prizes sons over daughters, and I was an only child, and I had aunts uh, who visited my father to advise him to have a son because you only have a daughter. And I still remember this conversation, and uh, my father actually said something to the effect of how, you know, Mahatma Gandhi had five sons, and nobody knows of them, but, uh, you know, Nehru has one daughter, and she's famous, right? So, um, and from that time, I was always questioning why was it that girls were prized less than boys in our society? And this was in everything, whether you eat, when do you eat, whether you can participate in any cultural event or religious event and so um, you know transforming that um, you know kind of societal community and even familial attitudes towards your status so yeah so it's been really the personal is I think very political with regards to the work that we do yeah Mona what about you yeah I think I was um, 20 when I heard about uh, violence and discrimination against women uh, being justified in the name of our culture. And I think it was at that moment that it really hit me because I said, I really realized that I came from a family where there wasn't violence or discrimination against girls. And I said, this can't be our culture. You know, I know my family, I know other families where this is not practiced. So what is our culture? It is not something that somebody else says this. So I kind of, that's kind of when feminism became real to me, because I think that's when I realized it wasn't just about class politics, but also gender, and also about reclaiming our culture, because it wasn't that there is only one culture, and the culture that is being, you know, sort of uh, used to justify discrimination or violence isn't necessarily our culture. Uh, and so I, I came from a background where I did not have that discrimination, but I realized that there were many such people and families in India where there isn't discrimination, and that's also our culture. Thank you. Jotam. Well, uh, for me it was uh, my childhood also, because um, in Uganda, uh, I was born in a, a very remote area, the southwestern part of Uganda, and uh, when I was little and going to school, I used to go to school bare feet. And uh, I noticed that uh, in my village, uh, the community, women were dying. They were not, not that the women themselves were men, the population was sparse, but women were dying disproportionately during childbirth and, uh, and, and pregnancy. And uh, so when I went to school and I did well, and uh, I started thinking that I should do something for these women who are dying. So I then chose to go and do public health, and uh, that's where my passion comes from. Thank you for all you're doing, for all that you're all doing. And I must admit, for me, my moment came um, six, my moment came about six years ago when I, by coincidence, found out that child marriage is a harmful practice that is affecting 15 million girls every year and is having a huge impact on a whole host of development issues from education to the spreading of HIV AIDS to maternal health, infant health. And I was shocked to learn that there was a problem that is so big and is having such a big impact on efforts to eradicate poverty. 
and yet was getting so little attention. I mean, these 15 million girls were, were pretty much invisible, so that was my moment where I said, change needs to happen. And I'm very proud to, to be here with you of all, all of you today. Um, but let's start looking at how are we going to implement these SDGs. And Jotam, if I can start with you. The view from Africa, how do you think the SDGs are different from previous development uh, frameworks that we have seen? And how it seems that the, the catchphrase now for the SDGs is, is reaching the most vulnerable. How do you think we are actually going to make that happen? Well, uh, as you know, the, the MDGs were very good themselves. And, uh, and I think a lot of countries, including developing countries in Africa, in Uganda, I think the countries did try to do what they could, and, and we achieved some things with the MDGs. But I think the MDGs uh, didn't have inclusiveness. Uh, they didn't focus very much on the young people. They didn't focus very much on the vulnerable, the rural poor, whom we really need to target. So I think we welcome the sustainable development goals in that context, because in them, we have seen that we are more holistic, and, and, and I think that is the challenge that we are going to have. We must do things. It should not be business as usual. I think we need to target the poor, the people in rural areas, the hard to reach, and the, in particular, and we, I think we saw this in the previous session, the young people need to be reached. We have uh, a, a group of young people, a whole cohort of young people, both girls and boys, who need to be reached, and, and we make sure that we, we do something meaningful for them, and, uh, and I think that is where we are going to have inclusive growth if we can do that. Thank you. Um, Mona, looking at the SDGs from, from Asia, what do you think needs to be done to make sure that, that they become a success in your region? I think um, Asia, um, it's a huge and diverse uh, region. Um, there's quite high levels of development and growth, but also increasing inequality uh, and quite high levels of inequality now. Um, for me, um, critical to that, and particularly when you look at uh, South Asia, but also Southeast Asia, violence against women remains one of the biggest uh, issues, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because in a sense, while women are given opportunities, uh, there is a higher uh, you know, focus on uh, employment for women, um, education, other things. Uh, women, in a way, are kind of being pushed out of their homes, but at the same time, there is increasing violence against them in the streets, in the workplaces, in their homes, virtually also on the net. Um, and I think this is something that is about mindsets mm -hmm. and social norms uh, uh, that need to change. So along with development, I think this is becoming one of the biggest issues. And I think unless we are able to really address that, it's going to be very hard to really achieve the SDGs. So I think really working at changing mindsets, um, addressing social norms um, and practices, and engaging the whole section of population, because there's also increasing identity politics and the in, you know, exclusion of many groups of people. Um, again, this is something that is fracturing our, our societies. And if we want a plural Asia that is inclusive, we really need to be addressing these mindsets. Thank you. And I would like to come back to that later, the issue of how we're going to make social norm change actually happen. Uh, Deborah, women in, in Latin America are facing a host of challenges, from a, a femicide to the rape of young girls and then denying them abortions if they, if they get pregnant. Um, we will talk a bit later in this panel about Zika, but can you please help us get a picture of, of the challenges that girls and women face in Latin America and what that means in the context of the SDGs? Thank you, Mabel, for raising this question together related to femicide and abortion. Femicide is a new language that from Latin America we create to talk about something that we know as violence against women. When women are killed, just because they are women. But at the same time, why putting together femicide and abortion? Because <coughs> both kill women. And this week, we have a trial in El Salvador. Teresa is a woman who had a spontaneous abortion. And when she went to the hospital, the physicians called the police. 
and she was sentenced to more than 44 zero years in jail. So, yes, we have to discuss both together. <laughs> Abortion and violence are killing women in Latin America. Siva, you have said that we cannot achieve the agenda for girls and women unless their sexual and reproductive health is realized or are realized in its totality. Can you elaborate, elaborate a bit? Yeah, I think it's very much like how you had you know, mentioned on early age marriage as well, right? Um, so all of these um, issues are so interlinked and um, sexual and reproductive health and rights are actually indivisible, indivisible from economic, social, cultural, and political rights, you know, and they're necessary ingredients. Um, and SRHR itself has many close interlinkages with all of this, which are considered by governments as the large developmental issues like food security, climate change, migration, whereas like, you know, women's <coughs> issues, gender equality, and SRHR are like the softer, you know, secondary issues. Um, but you see, without autonomy over our bodies, we really cannot achieve autonomy over our lives. You know, and every individual must have the right to decide whom to love, whom we can have consensual relations with, whom we can enter into marriage with, and you know, the right to decide how many children to have, if any at all. So, um, and the SDGs will only be successful if such things that make the difference in an individual girl, an individual woman's life, you know, um, ensuring that we're able to prevent early age marriage for the girls in the villages, ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health for poor women in marginalized communities, as well as create, you know, a life as like um, Mona was saying, like, you know, a life free from violence, you know, and that's when that real transformational change in society occurs, and that's meaningful change, that it means something, not for a government that's reporting a number in a report in the UN agency, but makes a real difference in the lives of women and girls on the ground, on the issues that matter to them. So that's why I think that SRHR is like, you know, really critical to achieving the SDG agenda. <laughs> Thank you. Tawakol, you, um, you were on the SDG commission, so you helped to draft the 169 targets. Um, you yourself come from a very volatile region. Uh, there is definitely no female women equality there. Um, your country has become a conflict zone. Um, in your view, what are the most important goals or targets of the SDGs? If you are allowed to choose <laughs> as a member. I like all the uh, 17 uh, goals because I feel that every goal is my goal. Uh, and um, when the UN called me that they want me to be in the high profile uh, uh, committee to write the sustainable development agenda for 2015, I was very, very happy because I always call myself as a global citizen. So that was a big opportunity for me to implement what I dream for, which is, you know, putting the sustainable development agenda for all over the world. And I was, you know, I, I was asking myself, and we were at the committee chaired by the David Cameron and the president of uh, Indonesia and the uh, president of uh, Liberia, my colleague, uh, uh, she's Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And we were, okay, how can we add something valuable to the sustainable de de development agenda? How can we add something valuable to the MDGs? So, it's, so we decided to put it, so we decided to, to put the, to, to see to the sustainable development agenda from all dimension. It's uh, as in political, in economic, in uh, uh, um, uh, uh, social and also environment. So because of that, you see the 17, uh, uh, DG, uh, SDGs yeah, cover all this, you know, field. The most important thing that I was very you know, focused on, I can say the three targets, which is, you know, the poverty, because the uh, MDGs and the previous uh, SDGs talking about how to make the poverty less, but we put it as, uh, uh, as ending poverty 
ending hunger, zero poverty, zero hang hunger. We want to reach to the 2015 with zero hunger and zero poverty. Uh, regarding also the women, we talk about fault participation of women, empowering women and girls, uh, uh, equality, you know, uh, uh, gender equality. And uh, uh, um, goal 10, which is a very important uh, goal, which is uh, reducing the inequality inside the countries and among countries. And the most important thing for me, yes, it is. Yes, this is a very important goal. And the most important thing with which is I was focused on, which is how can we put good governance in the sustainable development agenda? And I was fighting a lot for this thing. So the 16 uh, goal, which is talking about peace, justice, and accountable uh, institution, inclusive institution is a very f victory for everybody, for every person, for all the humanity that we, yani want, you know, that, that uh, knows that peace means development and development means peace. Justice means <laughs> development, yes. And development ju uh, means justice. So uh, in, this, uh, in this article, in this goal, which is talk about even talking about the stolen assets, even talking about, about freedom of speech, even talking the, about human rights. So I am so proud to be part of, the, of all of it. And we should now talk how can we make this sustainable development agenda real. How to make it talking about how, how, how will we that's implement the good news. it? I yes. completely agree. That's what we, we're going to yes. try to figure out in this panel, hopefully. Lena, some people say the worst place in the world to be a woman is in the Middle East. Can you please tell us? Is that true? And what's happening? Uh, I think it's true. I think it's definitely uneven, but it's definitely true because if you look at our indicators, at least on two levels, we are not faring so well in terms of women's economic participation and in terms of women's political participation and also in terms of protection from all forms of violence and exploitation. And you, you have to add to, to this three important factors. One is that our states are totally unaccountable to anybody. Secondly, uh, the fact that the region is being brought back to the Middle Ages with uh, religious extremism, terrorism, ISIS and company, which by the way, in parentheses, have no borders as we see. They, uh, it's not only the problem of our region, it's a general problem. Uh, and also because so long as our region does not move towards secularization of states and uh, 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 separation of religion from state, I don't think women can truly aspire to, 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 to equality. But also, uh, and if I may, that's the last uh, point. Um, I think one of our main problems is not acknowledging individual rights, the rights of individual women and men. Uh, Clans, tribes, ideas, religions, they do not have rights. Women have rights and, indiv and individuals have rights. Uh, as long as we do not make this shift, then yes, it is one of the most miserable places for women to be. Thank you. You know, it seemed that if we look back at the MDGs, which, which were definitely a big success, I, I also think that although there was a huge progress made, the SDGs were in a, the MDGs were very much dealt with as silos, and we might have missed some opportunities in, in cross-linking across the different sectors. So now we have we have 17 goals, we have 169 targets. So my question is, do we now have 169 silos? And, and you know, what are we, can we do, and what's the relationship between the different targets that that we can you know look at when we implement the SDGs, so that we avoid some of the missed opportunities of the MDGs? And so, Hina, I, I wanted to start by by asking you: 169 targets. Does that mean 169 priorities, or is it now up to governments to pick and choose and and maybe focus on the easy ones? Um, what would you recommend? You know, there's no easy way mm -hmm. to achieve any of these targets. <laughs> and it's a tremendous task, both for governments and for populations all over the world in terms of the social thinking that we've been speaking about. But I think you're right on when you say that if we, it, it would be a mistake to line the targets in order of priority. What we have to do is to select measures and then 
line them in order of urgency and priority, and those measures are the ones that will affect a lot of targets because they are interlinked. So it's the measures for me that are important. How intelligently can governments um, uh, select these measures and see how, which ones affect most of the targets. And you see, when you read the SDGs and the targets under most of the goals, you will realize that some of them are so closely linked that you don't have to take different steps for each one of them. <laughs> so that's why I think it's very important to, uh, to um, conduct a lot of consultations at governmental level, inside countries and at the international and regional level so that you can make sure that in a particular social, political, and economic context, what works for most of the targets. Secondly, I think um, it's imp important to realize that these targets have to be both um, uh, inclusive and participatory, and chosen and selected by the consensus of the people so that there is ownership, and governments are able to take their populations with them being able to convince them that the promotion of well-being for all is the broader uh, uh, objective of the SDGs. Uh, this is the essence both of democracy and of good governance. But I would stress rule of law as well. A rule of law that is constructed and defined by the values of international norms that we have taken so much time to create so that our measures are determined by uh, uh, good values. And I think that's very important. Uh, governments can't do it alone. Populations have to, have to make sure that they are participating in all efforts. So it's going to have to be a carrot and stick, um, um, uh, uh, you know, strategy for civil society, especially the organized sectors in every country, where you, at the same time, engage with governments, you help them achieve these goals, but at the same time, make sure that you are effective pressure groups when governments are lagging behind. That's very, a very clear assignment to all those here in the room who represent civil society, I think. Thank you for that, Hina. Um, Jotam, you were talking earlier about, about the need to have a holistic approach. And so when you look at, at this idea of connected targets and, and that we need to find identify interventions that could have multiple effects. Um, what, what do you think about, what does this all mean for the implementation on the ground of the SDGs? Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we've learned some very good lessons from the MDGs. Uh, the MDGs helped us to set policies, uh, broad policies, a number of them implemented very well, others not so well. But uh, in some of the things that we missed out was, for example, as we move forward with SDGs, the issue of integration, integration, working with the different sectors, uh, realizing that in order to achieve this, we must make sure that education is working with health in order to advance uh, what we are doing. Programs that, that are targeting women, uh, postnatal clinics uh, and, and services must know that like in the uh, low resource countries, women come with their children, so the question of uh, making sure that vaccinations are there, but at the same time, a woman maybe have walked uh, five, six kilometers with the child, and therefore for you to ask her to come again for family planning uh, after that is, so all, all of this, the issue of integration uh, by the national governments themselves, make sure they prioritize this, but also the donors themselves speaking the same language because we are all targeting the same people. I think the issue of integration is going to be extremely important if we are going to achieve our targets in the uh, post-2015 development agenda. The other issue is, and I think this has been talked about, is the question of looking at those groups that have not been targeted before properly. The vulnerable, those who are in remote areas, the hard to reach areas, uh, I think the MDGs showed us that yes, we can make progress I, in countries like Rwanda, in Kenya, in Ghana, in Senegal, uh, in my own country, Uganda. We've seen, we've seen uh, things happening. I, I, immunization programs have brought down infant mortality. Infant mortality that took uh, European countries, I have nothing against them, it took them many decades. In, in some of these countries, those which have done very well, 
they have been able to reduce infant mortality by more than half within a, a relatively short period. And, and obviously they learned from what others have done. Uh, and like now we have technology coming in, mobile technology. If we can take advantage of, of these things and not reinvent the wheel, I think we can make tremendous progress in the, in, in the SDGs. I think you're right. And so that we now need to do that. Mona, um, how are you looking at this implementation question, the challenges of coordination, reaching out to those most in need, but maybe also the issue you raised earlier of the need to, to also change social norms if we want to be effective? Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, I think uh, probably it's about recognizing that we need to work at many different levels. Um, so certainly looking at SDGs um, as a whole and not just looking at um, SDG 5. Um, and we've seen it needs, these are connected. Uh, so for women's organizations, the women's movement, to recognize that we need to work right across the SDGs. Um, but also to, uh, to work together. And I think that's kind of critical that we need to be working together, diverse sectors to come together to really help achieve uh, these SDGs. Uh, working with the government, uh, because getting this into implementation, I mean, it's a critical um, issue. We've just, uh, in Indonesia, for example, we've just started working uh, with, the, with the help of uh, the European Union to actually translate into implementation some of the SDG goals and targets. Uh, how does it actually happen? And there, the civil society engagement with the government is quite critical, and women's rights organizations also getting involved is very critical. So that we are working across SDGs, engendering, so it's about focus programs, but also gender mainstreaming. Um, so that's kind of one level of work. The other critical part of, of, of course, is that we need to continue. If we want, on one hand, we have targets. On the other hand, you have government um, norms or legislations or laws that also keep changing. Um, so for instance, needing to keep working uh, in terms of public opinion, in terms of mindsets, in terms of social norms. Uh, for instance, the, we, we are talking over here a lot about early marriage, but when governments are under pressure to reduce the age of marriage, so, you know, you might have targets. On the other hand, the government's under pressure from different parts of uh, society to actually reduce the age of marriage. How do you actually work with that? So we need to work in terms of public opinion. We need to make these SDGs also something that is understood by all um, and that it is linked into what we are in terms of our social thinking. Uh, because otherwise we could be working at one level and losing, um, you know, sort of ground on the other. And I think this is a constant uh, sort of issue uh, and a balance that we need to make. So we shouldn't be just focusing on the government or implementation, but we should also be working with people and building up a movement uh, that actually promotes and supports the SDGs. Thank you, Mona. Um, Siva, I would like to build on to this a little bit. Um, so, so it sounds like we really need to start focus on, on the root causes of some of the challenges rather than, than the symptoms. And when you look at that, and, and when you think then about the structural inequalities that we see in society, when you think about the social attitudes towards women, what would you recommend that, that we focus on? Yeah, when we um, use a big word like structural inequality, uh, we need to understand how like, you know, girls and women, you know, are systematically discriminated against. I think Hina mentioned about the legal system, right? So, Women do not have the equal rights that men do, whether it regards, you know, divorce, uh, familial uh, inheritance, as well as marriage. Um, and in that way, and that kind of permutates down to the other aspects, whether it's in family life, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the workplace, right? So marginalization of women to speak up, to participate, and to make decisions in all levels of society, right? And this is what we're trying to um, address. And this is a huge issue which we've been trying to work on for many, many years. Um, and if you look at early age marriage, right? So what is it happening that culturally and socially it is kind of uh, related to how the structures are actually 
showing the societal attitudes rather than transforming the societal attitudes. So culturally and socially, girls are considered as a, to be under the control of their families, right? They are properties of their, of, of their fathers. And then through marriage, this uh, ownership is transferred to their husbands. Um, and uh, she's not respected as an equal, and she's not able to make decisions about her own body, whether it is access to contraception, access to safe abortion, access to information and services, um, inability to even perhaps divorce or take uh, control or have, um, I mean, take custody of her children in some uh, communities. And as well as, you know, with regards to her own sexuality, how does she, you know, her sexuality is within the framework of procreation and marriage, right? And um, unless we kind of transform the status of girls and transform the status of women, that we are now considered equal citizens, you know, in our own that this change is simply is going to be impossible to happen. So even in like, for example, we did this very interesting uh, research on climate change and SRHR. So what happens is that um, during our research in Bangladesh, we discovered that in the cyclone times, the cyclone Sidr and Isla, that poor families then resorted to marrying off their girls early to kind because this was their coping strategy and the coping mechanism because the mindset change hadn't taken place. And number of countries, so in India and in Bangladesh, we see the economic growth is happening quite well, and yet the transformation of societal attitudes is somehow not growing at this 5%, 6%, 7% that the economy is growing. And unless we make really, ins we have to make these investments and governments need to make these investments. You see, the country I come from is Malaysia. We are considered a middle income country. Um, we are also famous for other things. But um, other than that, uh, we also have this um, instance where suddenly we have universal free education for girls in primary school, in, uh, in secondary school, and we actually have a greater enrollment of girls in university as compared to boys. And yet, in this country that is giving out free education to everyone, we are now seeing a rising number of early age marriages. Mm -hmm. Why is that happening? It is because the minds have not been transformed. You know, mm -hmm. so I think this is why this is perhaps the most critical piece. You know, and until, I mean, and we only talk about women and girls, mm -hmm. there are other attitudinal transformations that need to happen across caste, class, you know, tribes, indigenous people, migrants, refugees, that also needs to take place. And it's actually a learning process for all of us, you know, not just, uh, not just, you know, people from the south learning from the north, but, you know, we all have to transform our attitudes in one way or another. Thank you. Listening to you and to Mona also <clears throat> makes me realize that, um, as, as there will be an increased focus on, on attitude change, it's really those who know best, the people working in the communities, in those societies, who, um, who should take the lead. And I think it is, it is uh, maybe obvious, but I would like to stress it again. We from the West who want to help should do so by empowering and serving those are going to do, have to do the real work. And I think we should never forget that, that that is the role of those of us who, who are willing to help from the West, the so-called West. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke a little bit about, about what happens when, when crisis hits. And Lina, I wanted to come back to you. And uh, basically, it seems that, that some of the biggest challenges to girls and women happen in fragile states, whether it is conflict, whether it is displacement, whether it is natural disasters. Um, and I would love if you can tell a little bit about what the impact of the horrible conflict in Syria is having for the SDGs and, and for, in general, girls and, and women in the Middle East. Sure. And thank you for this question. Um, what I want to begin by saying is that uh, the only thing that is different about the, dis the displacement crisis resulting from the Syrian war is just the magnitude. There is nothing that we haven't seen before. Uh, from the perspective of Lebanon, for instance, it's only just a few, few years ago that there was a displacement from Iraq or from Sudan or from other countries. So the question is, why haven't we learned? Why haven't we learned, same as, exactly the same as has ha happened with the Iraqis, why haven't we learned that girls are going to be vulnerable, that, they are going to be, uh, that there is going to be trafficking, that there's going to be early marriages? The, these things have happened, it's only, it was just smaller in number, that's the only thing. 
And um, with this in mind, I think what is important for us is, um, and, I, and I really want to, I really want to emphasise this, the ways in which emergency is being done, uh, uh, with which perspective. Our colleagues spoke about mindsets. It's not just the mindsets of co uh, communities, it's the mindsets of the decision makers, of those who have the resources. Uh, just a few days ago, before coming here, uh, I'm not going to name names, but one of the biggest uh, uh, humanitarian agencies was saying that they are giving debit cards to men in, uh, uh, to displaced men. Debit cards meaning cash. And we all know, I mean, for heaven's sake, there's enough studies, research, uh, data that tells us what happens when you give the money to, to men. So wha what is the problem? Why aren't we, why aren't we learning? Secondly, why aren't we learning that, about the vicious role, and I insist on the word vicious, that faith-based organizations play in displacement camps, their role in radicalization, their role in undermining women, uh, if you look now in, in, the, in, in the region, those who have the most resources, those who are closest to the people, those who are controlling the minds of the people are actually faith-based organizations. We know exactly who is funding them, and they are friends of ours, by the way, so uh, uh, embarrassing friends of ours. Mm -hmm. So why haven't we learned? Why, do, why can't we put in place the necessary legal framework to protect displaced women? Because we know what the problems are. We can't, we're not even managing birth registries, for heaven's sake. Uh, mm. in, in, I, again, um, if, if I only take the case of Lebanon, uh, UNHCR was saying just a, few, uh, a couple of years ago, we were almost, we got to the point of 50,000 unregistered births. Do we know what it means? It means no schooling. It means even going back to Syria is problematic without papers. So these are the kind of, uh, this is the kind of different levels of impact. And as we are seeing and hearing, women and girls are, are my colleagues spoke about early marriages. I find it difficult to understand why in 2016 we can't stop girls who are four or five years old from being married. Why can't we do this? Why, why are we able to, you know, uh, to go into complex trade agreements and whatnot, but we can't stop a little girl from being married? Thank you. And if you allow me just one last thing, I really think we will all benefit if we are to invest in building the capacities, the, uh, uh, the confidence of girls and women who are displaced, if we are to invest in their working, in, in, in their organization, in working as, and we know the power of women organizing, I think that is, the, that is the best way in which we can invest and learn from experiences and mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. And I, I would hope with the humanitarian summit that is happening next week in Istanbul um, that, that the world will hopefully finally agree that basic humanitarian needs coverage isn't just shelter, basic health care and, uh, and clothing and food, but that actually education is part of a basic need. Because I think if we could give every refugee child education, then hopefully a lot more girls will not end up in child marriage, but it will also hopefully mean that a lot more boys might in the long term not start doing things uh, with their lives which, which will be counterproductive to our security. So um, I, I hope there will be that wisdom. Um, Deborah Zika. Things. Debra Zika. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think Seems. I have to change my name to Debra Zika. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. what is happening? And, and is the world responding in the way that we should? Really, thank you, Mabel, for raising this question in such a broad way that allows me to explain what is going on. And it's not only in Brazil, it's in the region. So I'm not talking as a Brazilian, because we are the epicenter of the epidemic. So basically, we have been talking a lot about mosquitoes. And yes, we have a vector that flies, and it's really, really something new for an epidemic that we have a vertical transmission like we have in Zika syndrome. But let's talk about numbers and how difficult it's to understand and to classify what is going on in Brazil as a humanitarian tragedy. The epidemic is in country for less than a year. WHO announced a public emergency in February. 
So everything is really new. And we have 7,000 women with babies with the neuro ne Zika neurological syndrome. We keep saying microcephaly, but microcephaly is only one characteristic of the syndrome. But again, we keep talking about women in general, but I, I, I got Zika late February. But I'm not the face and the voice of Zika women. We have to start to talk in an intersectional way. They have color, they, they are black and brown, they live in the most remote areas of the country. They do not have money to fly to Miami, Colombia, Mexico to have a safe abortion. And they do need to amplify the possibilities and changes of family planning. Long-lasting methods are not available, not only in Brazil, but in El Salvador again. Emergency contraception is banned by law. So Zika epidemic, forces us to understand how reproductive health and rights, and openly speaking, right to abortion, has to be understood as a human right. This is my main point. And, and do you see that dialogue starting? Do you see leadership emerging? Or, or does it mean that civil society will have to become more active, more loud, more, more convincing? You know, I'm here because we are trying to empower that voice. So really, thank you. But it, giving again an example for Brazil, you're facing a political crisis. We turned to the president, and it's not only giving a secret from my country. This is the situation in Latin America. So we don't want to talk about women and girls because it's really dangerous to talk about these issues facing an epidemic that we have to openly discuss reproductive rights and needs. So, no, we need the international attention, looking to Latin America, and stop talking that we are, in case of Brazil, a developed country, because oh. we are not. Oh. Thank you. Hina, I, I would like to um, move to uh, the questions of who are actually going to take the lead in doing some of the things that we've been discussing and, and using these methods of integration, etc. And I was wondering to which extent you think now we have these, these global goals, do you think implementation should primarily be done on a regional level? Is it going to be each country for themselves? Is it going to be governments? You already spoke a tiny bit about, about the role of civil society in, in implementing the SDGs. Can you elaborate a little bit of how you see that this, these wonderful goals are actually going to be done? Look, I, I don't think that um, we can say that anybody can do this alone. So it has to be in partnership and several kinds of partnerships. I think government alone can't do it, so civil society has to pitch in. But at the same time, I think the primary responsibility to protect, and I see the SDGs goals really as a duty to protect uh, that is very much on the shoulder of the governments. How they create those partnerships is also going to be primarily how governments determine their own roles and how willing they are to, to not exclude but include people in partnership. For instance, I think a lot of what we are looking towards is not dependent only on state policy. The state has to tackle non-state actors, be it violence against women or discrimination. You cannot avoid taking responsibility to change the kind of mindset that we are talking about. And that will not come if you give concessions to the very realities we want to change. The whole question of the, the, the early marriages uh, and girl, uh, how we cannot stop uh, young children to be married. Look, the point is, we've been make, linking um, harmful practices to either re religion, culture, or tradition. These are realities we need to change. Why do we make concessions to these realities? So impunity, <laughs> impunity for me is an exceptional problem and is going to be an impediment if, if governments do not have the will and the courage to deal with these issues and deal with non-state actors and the private sphere where women are suffering. 
harm. And it's not just women. Look at other vulnerable communities and groups, uh, indigenous people. Uh, look at the whole question of disability, children, girls, adolescents. So there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done, and it cannot be done without creating that kind of right thinking, partnerships, and the commitment that we need. Now, the other thing that I would like to raise is this whole question of where do we do it? We do it at all levels, international. The very fact that this uh, SDGs uh, uh, process has involved the international community. And when I say international community, I emphasize that there is no notion of international community without, the, uh, uh, without extending that notion to civil society. So it's not just states who are the international community. It is civil society also that is a part of the international community. But what we want to do is to give governments the courage to take measures. It is important that you involve more and more governments. So let's say at the regional level, I give a lot of importance to creating that kind of environment because regional governments are generally working in similar contexts, both social and economic as well as political. So what one country can do, the other takes courage from that. And secondly, the mindsets are almost similar. In my region, for instance, in South Asia, the whole question of discrimination, early and forced marriages, honor killings, it happens everywhere. So when you tackle the tradition and cultural uh, uh, back, uh, you know, kind of baggage on these things, governments take that kind of courage from each other. So I do believe that with similar capacities, similar uh, capabilities, similar social and economic and political context, it's important that we create platforms at the, at the uh, regional level, both civil society platforms as, as, as well as intergovernmental platforms, so that there is regional commitment and peer pressure to achieve at least the very essential goals that make women's well-being and vulnerable communities, well-being a part of the SDGs uh, uh, advocacy and, and um, um, the kind of achievement that goes with, you know, actual ben benefits seeping down to the more vulnerable communities as well as general well-being of people as a whole. Thank you, Hina. That's, uh, I think, a very clear instruction on how we should, should be doing that. Thanks for your wise words. Mona, what, what role do you see specifically for, for girls and women in the implementation of the SDGs? I think um, uh, taking uh, further from where Hina was talking about the international and the regional level, I think it also needs to go down to the grassroots. And for me, critically, it's about women's leadership. Uh, women and girls' leadership at the grassroots level, because I think that's really the front line, uh, the front line where we actually tackle the kind of problems that we want to resolve with, uh, with the SDGs. Uh, so having a critical mass of women leaders uh, at the community level, at the provincial level, uh, is going to be something really important also to get the inclusion of, of groups that have been left out of the MDGs or have le been left out of development. So women from these communities, women leaders from these communities who are actually addressing these issues, who are finding the solutions also in their communities and having a critical mass of them who are aware, who are capable, who are supported to be able to take this uh, forward. I think that's going to be very, very important. And I'll just give you an example um, of a woman leader from Indonesia, um, uh, Ernabati, uh, Nayu Ernabati. Uh, she was a provincial leader uh, in one of the municipalities in, in a city in uh, Indonesia. Uh, and she is uh, strong at gender budgeting. And so in her city, uh, girls have free education uh, till uh, for 12 years as compared to the national average of nine years. Now that's keeping girls in school, that's, a lot, that's uh, preventing early marriage. Um, so this is, this is the kind of thing that leaders, women leaders at the community, at the provincial level, the kind of changes they can bring. In Pakistan, women leaders working at the community level, at the provincial level have enrolled hundreds of thousands of women to get their national identity cards. And that makes a huge difference because they can vote, they can get services, they have an identity. 
Um, so this is the kind of change that they bring about, they can bring about. So really enabling these women leaders uh, to continue that work, to grow that work, to grow their numbers, I think is going to be really important for us to achieve the SDGs. And making sure, as Hina said, that we take courage from each other so that these women leaders are connected regionally and internationally so that you are actually having a support and it's a movement. Thank you. Thank Jotam, you. It's, it strikes me as we're talking a lot about the role of girls and women, what about the boys and the men? Do you have any strong views on, on the role they should play? Well, the, the, the boys and the men, uh, a lot of them are the ones in the positions of leadership in the, a lot of our developing countries, including Uganda. Uh, we have women leaders, yes, but the, the leadership is uh, dominated to some extent by the men and, uh, and boys. And so they clearly have a responsibility. And, uh, and, and I think uh, I know there are policymakers in, in the audience here. There are ministers, I can see, there are members of parliament, uh, but by and large, they are dominated by the males. But again, bringing out the issue of uh, policy frameworks that work for these, the women and, and, and girls. Uh, policy frameworks, not those that remain on the shelves. Uh, governments are, have a responsibility to make sure policy is right. But we also know that with the partnering with the donors, partnering with the civil society organizations to do what they are best able to do, not only giving services, but also holding governments accountable on those policies, some of them which are just on the shelves, and making sure that these policies are working for the girls and, and the women, uh, wherever they are. Uh, but also the donors making sure that their role is also to make sure that they are delivering as one with the government and with the civil society. I think that is the direction we should be taking along the line. Clearly, the men and the boys have a role to play. And, and I think we should also uh, mentor our young boys to make sure that they know they respect uh, women at, from an uh, other age, uh, to know they are equal. And, and I think that is the way we, we should be doing things differently. In a number of our countries, and, and I think this debate has been going on, the, the boys, as they grow up, they are told they are special, they are not like girls, and things like that. And uh, I have my daughter in the audience here, so I want her to hold me accountable on this. Uh, we should make sure that as we bring our children, uh, they, are, they are equal, they are e given equal benefits, they have equal access to education, and all the resources available, and, and I think that's the way we should be moving. So we must have a, a mindset that has, has changed. It cannot be business as usual, especially in these developing countries where it has been uh, not, not, not favoring the, the, the girls. Thank you. Tawako, what progress do you think we can make for, for girls and women in fragile states? And, and who should be leading in these crisis situations to make that progress? Uh, the progress uh, will not be there if we didn't help their people to take their freedom and also to have sustainable peace in their region. So it's very important to help these societies that suffered from conflict on building sustainable peace. Again, sustainable peace needs development. And I want to talk about you know, uh, well, uh, the, the implementation, if you allow me. The implementation needs uh, the uh, participation from the, the government. The government should put the sustainable development agenda inside their strategies, inside their plans. And there is a big duty uh, regards to the uh, rich countries, rich uh, governments, this globalization must be fair. This globalization must, uh, all the humanity should to share the benefit of globalization. That means the rich countries, the strong countries should make all their responsibilities for the development countries. Imagine if they really has really decision, political decision to implement SDGs, if they uh, determine income from, you know, the, from the national income for implementing the SDGs. Imagine what is the, 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 the role of the private sector, the rich people who just take and they didn't give 
they have to put a good percent of their you know, incomes for, the, for SDGs. And also, so governments at all, the strong governments, the private sector, and also UN, we have to empower UN. UN has to have, uh, to finance the, 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 uh, the SDGs. They have a lot of responsibility to make it real. And UN doesn't have enough money to make, yeah, to implement all these, you know, uh, important, you know, goals. The last thing, and which is more important things, which is our role as civil society, as women, as, you know, uh, that we have to observe the government, we have to push on it, we have also to participate in the program. So it's a big, big responsibility. We have to make our talk to be real. Yeah. I agree. Um, we're going to open this up for questions from you. Um, so we have a microphone there. We have, I think, a second microphone somewhere there, but I can't see it. And so anybody who would like to ask a question to one of these amazing panelists is very welcome to stand up, walk to the microphone, and um, I would... So you would have to walk to the microphone, otherwise we're never going to hear you. Um, so please, and in the, in the meantime, Mona, maybe I can ask you, um, we've been talking about many, many actors that need to get involved, um, but we haven't really spoken a whole lot about the 1.8 billion people who are called youth. And <laughs> so what, um, how, what role do you see them play in, in this big story? Yeah, I think, um, I think in Asia we already are, um, you know, very aware that our population is actually young. Uh, so the, they are a big demographic uh, uh, sort of uh, entity now, um, and um, increasingly articulate. Uh, I think uh, we recognize that it's really, really important to work with them. Uh, so in Bangladesh, for instance, and we are working with young women and men uh, in terms of leadership, uh, because I think it's also important that we work both with young men and women together uh, to build a leadership that is actually um, already thinking about equality. Um, so I think that's certainly something that we are recognizing is quite important. They are a large group. They play an important role even in terms of elections. Uh, but at the same time, how do you channelize their energy is something that is a big challenge. Thank you very much. Um, so. I think um, we can uh, agree that the panelists have indeed all been brief and brilliant. And as we're going to take questions from the floor, the idea is that you're going to be even briefer and definitely as brilliant as the panelists in your questions. And question means asking something, not giving us a story, please. I'm really sorry, but otherwise this experiment is not going to work. Um, so. Please introduce yourself, and, and if your question is directed to anyone in particular, please mention to whom it is directed. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Sylvia Beals. I work with HelpAge International, and I want to congratulate everyone on the panel. Uh, very um, insightful and illuminating. My question is actually very, uh, follows the last comment about youth. We work with older people across the world and have um, worked hard to ensure that age is within the Sustainable Development Goal uh, framework, which we agree is transformative, ambitious, uh, a real shift, fantastic. Um, and also agree with the speakers who have said that it's from the grassroots now that people must know about this promise and leadership must come from there. So, so what's your question? My question to the panelists is how to ensure that all ages, uh, that equally with youth, but equally with older activists, uh, they can be encouraged to be part of this process. And particularly with women older leaders, how do we get to those grassroots women who have not been used to be leaders? Thank and you how can we much. encourage that? Thank you. Wonderful. I suggest we take two or three questions and then anybody who wants to respond, please. My name is Jacqueline. Uh, I'm from Denmark, but I'm from Rwanda as well. Um, speaking on Rwanda perspective, 
that the Rwanda has achieved uh, this kind, kind of all those goals uh, speaking about and due to the gender issue and having women in decision making that uh, Rwanda parliament have 64 percent of women in the parliament but um, my question is to Uganda maybe to everyone else what is Uganda doing to learning from Rwanda because the achievement of Rwanda is visible worldwide and the women in the parliament are making decisions doing to empower girls and the government has achieved this and it can work for all the countries I guess and if Rwanda can do it every country can do it because Rwanda was not a country for 22 years and women were the victim of genocide but today are the women are driving that country which seems to be the most in, uh, the most developing country in Southern Sahara. Thank so my question is much. for Uganda. Good question. Thank you very much. We're going to take one or two more, and then we're going to... Yeah, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I'm Ziaul Rahman from uh, Awaz, uh, CDS Pakistan, and I am also representing Pakistan Parwan Alliance that works for the SRHR promotion in Pakistan. Uh, this is really good that uh, the SDGs are now talking about the rights, uh, but unfortunately we have witnessed that uh, the civil society spaces are shrinking across the world. And uh, Madam Hina Jelani talked about the rule of law. We see that uh, the states are coming very hard to the civil society organizations and we have witnessed every uh, now and then new legislations, new administrative orders in such a repressive environment, how is it possible to talk about the rights-based approaches, particularly uh, r related to women and young girls? Thank you very much. And we'll take one more question from the other microphone, please. My name is Doreen Misek and I'm from the Turks and Caicos Islands. I think I'm one of the few Caribbean countries represented here. And over the last few days, I've been listening to some very interesting information sharing as it relates to sustainable development goals. And my question quickly is to Deborah. Deborah, you're from Brazil, the epicenter of the Zika. As you know, it's taking its turn throughout the Caribbean, especially countries such as Hispaniola, shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and other Caribbean countries. I must say here that Turks and Caicos Islands remain Zika-free. What are your thoughts on combining our efforts to beat this virus? Thank you. Deborah, do you want to react immediately? And then we'll respond to some of the other questions and then take a few more. So we're suggesting me to start. Okay, to this okay, one on Zika, okay. please. So the main explanation is that they are islands. So when we talk about an epidemiological phenomenon like this, islands are protected because they are isolated. But if we follow the movement of the epidemic, it's something that is moving fastly around the continent. So my answer is basically that. It's not only related to how public health policies were good examples in the region, it's much more related because they are islands. But I also would like to make a comment to Jacqueline related to the example of Uganda. I am really thank you that you raised this question because we lost our first female president last Friday. And all the new ministers are men. It's a macho club in Brazil at this moment right now. So we need to follow Uganda's example. Thank you. Um, as we are in Uganda, let's move to, to Yodam and hear from him. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline, for that uh, important question. It is important in that uh, not so much that Uganda may not be doing exactly the same as Rwanda. Rwanda has shown leadership on a number of issues. Some of them we have talked about them. Others we haven't talked about them. I can enumerate them. But uh, the point is that uh, not all the countries are necessarily on the same level. 
there is a lot of progress in Uganda as well. I just quoted infant mortality. Uganda achieved the MDGs on infant mortality. Life expectancy has uh, climbed up as a result of that in Uganda, which is good news. This We got this news like a month ago, so this is fresh. But I think the point you are making, the question of Rwanda, what is happening in, uh, in Ethiopia, in Ghana, in Senegal, Malawi, a number of other, even countries which are not resource, which do not have a lot of resources. Countries which are poor, when they have good leadership, effective leadership, the policies are there if they are implemented. Even poor countries can make progress. Uganda made progress on HIV AIDS in the 80s and 90s. Tremendous progress. It wasn't that it was any richer than the countries that had. So the issue, the, the point that really your question brings out is the fact that leadership, effective leadership at the country level is a very, very important thing. And, and I think this message should not only go to the civil society organizations and uh, donors, but to the political leaders who are here, ministers and the policymakers. Your, your role is critically important if we are going to achieve the post-2015 development agenda uh, by 2030. So it is a very, very important message. And uh, I'm glad you asked the question. It's interesting because it makes me think of what Kofi Annan sometimes says, that if the leaders don't lead, we the people need to make sure that they follow. <laughs> um, Tawakal, you want to come in? I want to say that um, I think it's shame on all humanity that after all this you know, year of uh, UN establishment that we don't have women to be general sec secretary. So. I think it, it's very important to be as outcome of this conference, women deliver, we, have, we should push for a new, you know, uh, general secretary to be a woman. This is a very important thing. And also I hope a woman also to lead the United States because we really <laughs> want to lead the world to implement SDGs. This is a very, very important thing. I, I believe on that. The second thing is with, uh, regarding to the, to the youth. Also youth, yes, when we, put, when we wrote the SDGs, we put youth as a target in every, every you know, sector, especially in the sector of the, um, of the job and you know, uh, other, you know, all other you know, um, uh, goals. But it must be not to be as a target. L youth should lead the implementation of SDGs. Within, inside the governments, inside the UN, inside every, uh, you know, uh, sector, you know, that's it. So that is a very important, youth should lead that. Other th final things, which is women and, uh, and youth, when we talk about women and youth, it isn't just something for prosperity. There is a woman and youth, they are struggling and sacrificing for getting a good life, for democracy, for freedom, for dignity, for development, for peace. Please be with them. People who are now dying in the street for taking their freedom, they are struggling for implementing SDGs. So we should be, we should hear the voice of the women who are in the street dying for the justice and peace and democracy and development. Thank you. Lena, you want to come in, and there are two outstanding questions on the all ages, um, including yes. the elderly women, and also the question from Zia from Pakistan about laws and civil society. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to comment on this, and uh, uh, the, the colleague from Help Age, uh, just to comment, I think you are quite, I can't see you, I think you are, yes, I think you are quite right. I don't think we have been as... Uh, um, as good in terms of including all, uh, 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 older women. And this is particularly true and problematic for the feminist movement. I think we are forgetting our elders, we are forgetting our first leaders. And for instance, if I ask anybody from the Arab region who are our first pioneer feminist, uh, uh, feminist figures, very few people will mention uh, those women who in the 20s led the feminist revolution by taking, out, taking off the veil, uh, which I think uh, is something that you can't even imagine now. So you are quite right. I think all of us have fallen into uh, 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 let's focus on the youth and let's forget, which in a way we're losing our history as the feminist movement. The other point I want to make, yes, 
yes for women leaders, but yes for feminist women leaders. Uh, <laughs> and I think it, it, makes, it, makes, a, it makes a huge uh, difference because um, we are hoping that uh, uh, both at the community level, at the local level and at the international level, we have feminist women who understand uh, uh, what discrimination <coughs> is about and who are committed to address this discrimination and who, are com and, 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 and who understand what is patriarchy and how uh, prevalent and how, again, I use the word vicious it is. And for us to make any progress forward, then it is a joint fight to actually destroy patriarchy. Nina, you wanted to come in on this as yes, well. Yes, I'm very glad that this whole question of the promotion and protection of human rights uh, uh, by, by allowing human rights activity um, and creating enabling an environment for civil society to function has been raised. Make no mistake, and I think here I address the whole global community. Without human rights defenders, you cannot promote and protect human rights. Without protecting human rights activity, you cannot achieve anything by way of development or uh, suspension of human rights violations. So I consider the difficult environment that is being created by governments in several countries of the world for human rights defenders and the civil society to function is going to be one of the most significant negative factors in impeding the achievement of these goals. I think the international community needs to look at it very seriously, both at the international level, even in the UN, civil society spaces are shrinking. But most importantly, at the national level, I said it earlier, nobody's gonna do it all alone. You cannot do it all alone. F uh, expand the spaces where you can find effective partnerships. Mental uh, 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 and, and mindset change will not be achieved by governments. Social policy of the state has to be matched with the energy with which the civil society functions. Don't deplete our energies by just resisting governmental impediments or fighting governments. We don't have the time for that. Here, here. Siva, you wanted to come in and then we'll take a few more questions. Yeah, I wanted to actually address two. Uh, one is the uh, question of the aging um, community and the second one was about civil society. Um, the first one about aging women. Um, interestingly enough, um, in the area of sexual and reproductive health, all the data we collect is only for women between 15 and 49. So after 49, nobody's collecting any data. So the sexual and reproductive health needs of these women are largely not counted. And even in simple things you can see in communities that have really aging populations, STI uh, infections amongst aging population is much higher because people just assume that, you know, before 15 you're not having sex and you're not reproducing and after 49 you're not having sex and you're not reproducing either. And you don't have any of those needs. So it's really important to like kind of change um, our mindset uh, with regards to uh, individuals and human beings and couples and men and women and how they're interacting with each other. Um, the second thing I want to talk about civil society is, yes, at the national level, there are great barriers being imposed by our governments currently. Uh, governments are uh, controlling the registration of civil society organizations, they are deregistering uh, de civil society organizations, they are continuously monitoring, auditing, uh, and they are bringing into force bl blasphemy laws, sedition laws, by which, you know, they are controlling the discourse on what can be spoken, what can be advocated for and what can be controlled. Unfortunately, women's rights, sexuality, LGBTIQ groups, these are at the forefront of all of these discriminations. Um, and in many countries, they're actually attacks on human rights defenders, but especially sexuality rights defenders, where, you know, their names are published, you know, the communities go after them, they are either hacked to death, burned to death, or whatever. So, yes, and, you know, one of the things that the international community can do, and I often say this about accountability, you know, me sitting in front of my Facebook and writing a comment about the Minister of Health, about the UN Secretary General, it's very easy. For member states to hold each other accountable to these kind of atrocities taking place in 
their countries. This is something we have to do. I mean, I think the international community should actually step up and say non-violence and non-discrimination against people of sexual orientation, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. This is a stand that we can make. You know, we should not shy away and saying that this is their every, every human being's right to be non-discriminated and having no violence in their life. Yeah. Thank you. Please, keep your questions really short because we're starting to run out of time. Thank you. I'm Seja Zabi from Norwegian Refugee Council. I'm Syrian and live in Syria. So I will talk from Syrian perspective. Uh, how to... Okay, I agree with you that we need cooperation between civil community and national community. But for my Syrian perspective, I talk about cooperation between all agencies, all organizations, NGOs, UN, to empower, to support Syrian women. So, uh, it's a shame on humanitarian to be uh, in this situation, Syrian women in the camps, out and in Syria. So when you talk about uh, CDGs, so I talk about solutions for this crisis for women, for uh, Syrian women and uh, generating income activities, not just for temporary aid and subsidies. Thank you. Who wants to take that question? Lina, I think yeah. you're the obvious law. Yeah, I don't think I understood the question uh, right, I'm afraid, so uh, I don't know if Seja wants to... What, what, Seja, what was your question? Do you have to talk in the microphone? In the mic. It's on. Okay. Uh, how to find cop mechanism to support women, Syrian women, more than this? Because the situation, all we know, that the situation for Syrian women is not good at all in the camps out of Syria. Mm -hmm. no, this I, is yes, definitely. I agree with you, except that I don't have an answer. But uh, um, one thing that I know a number of Syrian colleagues, women, are, are doing is actually strengthening links among Syrian feminists, and they do exist, and they exist in huge numbers. Uh, but particularly in terms of the participation of, and so far it hasn't been very successful, participation of Syrian women, feminist Syrian women, in the peace talks. Uh, both sides, or I don't know how many sides we have now, uh, have actually failed miserably in, 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 in having women participate in determining what the future of Syria is. And uh, I have to tell you an anecdote, if I may, uh, very quickly, that uh, a very high UN official uh, was saying, and again I'm going to name names, that he cannot force any side to bring women on, although he would be in his right, you know, in, in, he would have the right to implement 1325, con Convention 1325. So just to say, I don't have an answer for you, except to say that I know for sure that Syrian women, Syrian feminist activists are, are working very hard to partake in actually shaping the future of their country. Thank you. Now, um, we're, we're getting closer to the end, and there's going to be um, a final word set. But before we go there, I actually um, wanted to ask each of the panelists a question, which I think would be a missed opportunity if we don't do that. And that is, we have a wealth of experience, knowledge, and commitment sitting here on stage. And we have in the room and throughout the conference a lot of young people who are great activists, but also who feel that they still have a lot to learn. And so I wanted to ask each of you to basically say in 20 seconds, what is the one piece of wisdom that you would like to share with these young activists? Jotam, can I start with you? Yes, I think uh, the young activists need to know that they need to pursue their passion uh, with the courage uh, because uh, uh, these issues that we are talking about are marginal issues and in terms of development and yet their centrality in enrollment is so important, so they need to have passion, to have courage, and to know things can change, and that is very, very important. Thank you. Please, Mona. Um, yeah, I think my, what I would like to say is that um, the, your, your future is being defined now. So I think it's, you know, don't wait for something to happen. Step in and claim your space and define the future with us. 
Thank you. Siva. Um, I think that uh, one of the most um, in inspiring things and things that keep me grounded is the fact that, you know, you touch base and you are always talking to people in the communities, especially women and girls, and you see, you know, that despite all of this, like, really horrible things that we've talked about, that there is just still so much of beauty and creativity and energy at the ground level, and people are communicating, talking, and everybody has a wish to transform the world, so always be in touch with that. that that'll take you a long run and of course solidarity between sisters, solidarity between feminists, solidarity between movements. Yeah, this is also our strength. Yeah. Thank you. Hina. You know, Mabel, I don't know. I don't think wisdom can ever be transferred. <laughs> I think you learn through your own experiences like everybody here in this room will. But one thing I can say, everywhere that we are, each one of us has to understand that there is no more time and there is no benefit that can be achieved from turning your face away. If you are outraged, show it. Do something to make sure that you are not uh, a conspirator in silence. Thank you. Deborah. Yeah. I, I just broke my glass, so <laughs> I would like to look to a young feminist, a young activist here to thank you for being so brave, so creative, and giving us the honor to work together. So this is my final word. Thank you, Lena. I think I would say that uh, there's no compromise on rights, and uh, hopefully none of us will be in a situation where they would consider compromise. And the fact also that the principles of universality, indivisibility, and I, I always have a difficulty pronouncing the last one, inalienable of rights actually still stand, still stand to this day. And I think these are the foundations of the SDGs as well. Uh, there are no priorities. I think this is an open battle uh, where no compromises are acceptable. Thank you. And Tawako, please. Be the leader. And don't believe anyone that said that you are not wise enough or not, that you are not uh, qualified enough. Be the leader, be in the front line, don't afraid from anything, break all the walls around you, fight <laughs> corruption, fight tyranny, fight poverty, work for justice, then you will achieve peace and development. Yeah. Very wise word. So with that, I would like to give the last word to um, Kathy Russell, who is uh, the US Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. Kathy, Thank you. the floor is yours. Thanks. That's a good start. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Mabel. Thank you for your unbelievable leadership. And thank you, what an amazing panel. It was really great to listen to you. So recently, I traveled to Sudan, where I uh, visited a trauma center that works with both children and adults who've experienced sexual violence. So we toured the center, we passed by a bulletin board that had the usual things you would expect, uh, a brochure, a flyer for an event, inspirational quotes, and so on. Pinned at the bottom of the bulletin board was a chart of the sustainable development goals in Arabic. That's an image that I really thought was so powerful because it's a reminder that while the goals are indeed a global commitment. At the end of the day, they rely on local efforts. For us to succeed, we have to make sure the global goals are local goals. This morning, we heard about some of the tremendous work that's happening at the regional, national, and local levels. And we heard how these efforts do not stand alone. They are deeply connected, and they're surprisingly similar. We heard of the tremendous barriers, the deep, cultural attitudes stand in the way of gender equality, regardless of the country or region. Perhaps most importantly, we heard that the sustainable development goals are not a puzzle any one of us can solve. Not the UN, not policymakers, not one country or region, and not even civil society. We need everyone at the table working together to fully realize the global goals. And as we work, we need to remember that particularly in a world where borders are increasingly little more than lines on a map, each and every piece of the puzzle matters, even if it's not our own piece. 
I know many of you are working on your own part of the chart, your own piece of that puzzle. And because of you, we have made important progress on these issues. It can be easy to forget about that progress, especially as we read the news, watch terrible images on TV, and see the challenges facing women and girls every day. Women and girls suffering unimaginably at the hands of Boko Haram or Daesh, women who are trafficked, women who live with HIV, women who lack access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, and women who suffer violence and abuse. Girls who are forced into marriage are subjected to FGMC or denied an education. And women and girls with no opportunity and even less hope. But this week offers us a different view. It's a chance to see that there are 5,000 people just like you working to confront these challenges. And that's just at this conference. Around the world, governments, organizations, and individuals are working very hard to achieve these goals. Of course, individual efforts alone won't get us to the finish line. Coordination and inclusion are absolutely critical. One thing I know for sure is that our best chance of making the world a better place for women and girls is to address the challenges facing them comprehensively and to address the challenges together with them. And of course, because you will hear this over and over again over the last few days, the success of these efforts really will depend on good data. I want to emphasize that last point because it is truly critical. We need more data, particularly gender data that shows us where we are and where we need to go. Data that illustrates the experiences of women and girls, both independently and in relation to men and boys. I'd like to close with a thought that keeps me going when things are tough. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but that it bends toward justice. I believe that. But that bend does not happen on its own. It happens because of you. It happens because women and girls change the course of their own lives. It happens because organizations and individuals